Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursalin Sayyidina Muhammadin Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I can see people are recovering after Ramadan As Sheikh said a couple of weeks ago It's in Shawwal a very significant battle took place on the third of Shawwal, uh, the three Hijrah. And that was none other than the battle of Uhud. SubhanAllah. You know, we think, and maybe some of the Sahaba also thought, because they were so outnumbered at the battle of Badr, yet Allah granted them victory. Well, the bottom line is Allah granted them victory. And when they came into battle of Uhud, subhanallah, it was a different story. Let me take you through some of the steps, inshallah, so that we can also learn the lessons learned at the battle of Uhud. Anas bin Malik, rahimallah, qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas bin Malik said that Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ أُحُدًا جَبَلٌ يُحِبُّنَا وَنُحِبُّهُ Verily the mountain of Uhud loves us and we love it. SubhanAllah. The defeat at the battle of Badr was an embarrassment and a humiliation which the Quraysh pride could not leave unavenged. So revenge was foremost on their minds. And the catchword all over Makkah was revenge. You know, in the battle of Badr, his father, brother, and uncle, they were all killed. And her anger at the Muslims was immense. She used to wail and shriek for days and wandered uh, in the desert, pouring sand on her face and clothes until her husband assured her that the death of her family will be avenged. SubhanAllah. She promised a reward for the one who would bring back to her the heart of Hamza radiallahu anh, who was responsible for her father's and brother's death. So Abu Sufyan nursed the most grudge against the Muslim because why? He had lost heavy economic losses. So the Quraysh started fresh preparations to launch an overall war against the Muslims in order to restore the blemish prestige and wounded pride and they were determined to crush the commonwealth of Islam once and for all. It was also decided that the prophets of the escaped caravan headed by Abu Sufyan which amounted to a thousand camels and fifty thousand dinars should be devoted for providing equipment to the army and the noble Quran has alluded to this the decision of this in the following with Ba'da wa Billah min the Shaitan wa Rajeem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Inna ladhina kafru yunfiquna awalahum liyasuddu an sabirillah Very those who disbelieve spend their wealth to hinder people from the path of Allah فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا ثُمَّ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسْرَةً ثُمَّ يُغْلَبُونَ So will they continue to spend it but in the end it will become a regret for them then they will be overcome. SubhanAllah. They also devised other ways of recruitment, including hiring poets to entice the tribes into fighting the Muslims. You understand, at that time, the Jahiliya time, poetry was a, a huge thing. Okay? SubhanAllah. It still is today. SubhanAllah. A contingent of 3,000 warriors, of whom 700 were armored soldiers and 200 raw mounted cavalry with 3,000 camels and 15 women marched towards Medina. The general leader was none other than Abu Sufyan. The cavalry was under the leadership of Khalid bin Walid. That time obviously he was not a Muslim yet. Assisted by Ikrama bin Abi Jahal and Bani Abdaddar. They were all entrusted with the flag. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held a a military cons consultation <coughs> assembly in other words to exchange views about the situation and the Prophet of Islam suggested that his companions should not go out of Medina but they should encamp themselves in the city 
He was of the opinion that the enemy should be left in the open to tire themselves, to exhaust themselves. And thus a Muslim should not take the risk of the battle. But if they thought of attacking Medina, Muslim men would be ready to fight them at the mouths of the lanes, whereas a Muslim women would help them from the rooftops. Abdullah bin Ubay, he was the head of the Munafis, the hypocrites, who attended the meeting as a chief of Al Khazraj, and he supported the Prophet Sallallahu plan. His agreement was not based on the righteousness of the plan, but rather on personal benefit. He did not want to fight. He secretly aimed at being far away from the fight. You carry on. I'm behind you. Well, some people got this munafic attitude. However, it was Allah's will that he would be exposed and disgraced in public. Some of the companions who had missed the jihad in Badr because they were anxious, they want to fight now because they missed out. So they suggested the Prophet Islam should go up of Medina and urged him to accept their point of view. They were so sumum bukmur yeah, at the time, but because of the way they wanted to, to show the enthusiasm because they missed out. So they told them, oh, no, no, let us go and fight them head on. Eh? It was decided that the enemy should be resisted outside the city of Bukhur. At night, as the night fell upon them, they performed the sunset and the evening prayers and spent the night there as well. And of course, Abdullah bin Ubay, the Munafiq, the hypocrite, he rebelled against the Muslims and left with 300 fighters. He pulled out. He said, we do not know why we shall kill ourselves. I think we're hearing that today as well as some of the political Muslim leaders in the Arab world in, in the situation of the Palestinian issue. Allah, astaghfirullah, ya Allah. The real purpose of this rebellion or the withdrawal and detachment at this delicate and awkward position and time was to produce bewilderment and confusion of the mind and disorder in the Muslims army and breaking the high morale of the believers and consequently, they wanted the death of the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> and his faithful companions. And Islam as a whole, that, that's what it was. Then the way would be clear for them, for them to reclaim the presidency which had been lost on the advent of Islam in Medina. And Allah says about the Munafiks, And that he might test the hypocrites who are said to them, Come, fight in the way of Allah, or at least defend yourselves. They said, had we known that fighting will take place, we would have certainly followed you. They were that day near to kufr, to disbelief, than to iman, to faith. They are saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts. Allah protect us from that, Ya Allah. And Allah has full knowledge of what they conceal. The remainder of the Islamic army are now on the move to Uhud. After the rebellion and withdrawal of the hypocrites, the number of the soldiers were reduced to 700. The message of Allah with the remainder of the fighters moved towards the enemy. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mobilized his army and he arranged them into two rows to prepare them for fight. He selected 50 skillful archers that performed a squad and made them under the command of Abdullah bin Zubair. He issued his orders of them to stay where they were and clarify the mission of the squad in words he directed to them. He said to the leader, drive off the horses from us by means of arrows, lest they should attack us from behind the rear. Whether we win the battle or lose it, stand steadily in your position and mind that you are not attacked from your side. Nabi Al-Islam added, if you see us snatched into pieces 
by birth do not leave this position of yours till I send for you. Strict command. And if you see that we have defeated the enemy and trodden on them, do not desert your position till I send for you. This was a wise and carefully laid out plan which revealed the military genius and leadership of our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We find the assassination, Ya Allah, of Sayyidina Hamza, the Lion of Allah. Wahshi bin Harb was told, if you kill Hamza, the uncle of Muhammad, <coughs> stealthily you shall be freed. So Wahshi waited for the opportunity and he killed the Lion of Allah, SubhanAllah. And when it comes now to the archers, the archer squad whom Nabi Islam located on the mountain, they had the upper hand in administering the war activities to go on in favor of the Muslim army. Khalid bin Walid, who as I said was not a Muslim at the time, had three times attacked the left wing of the Muslim army with the aim of crushing it and to create confusion <coughs> and disorder in the ranks of the Muslims and subsequently inflict heavy defeat on them. But thanks to the dexterity and great efforts of the archers, the three assaults were thwarted. Right? But here is the fatal mistake. While the small army of Islam were on their way to another clear victory over the Meccans, the majority of the archers on the mountainside committed a fatal mistake that turned the whole situation upside down and constituted a source of heavy losses amongst the Muslims. In other words, they, did, they dis disobeyed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa command. That's what they did. And that's disastrous for us. Ya Allah. Forty archers deserted their posts. They were enticed by the role of victory as well as the greed for the spoils of war. These were the two things. That, that greed. And only nine under Abdullah, the leader, decided to abide by the Prophet Sallallahu order and stay. But it left them vulnerable. The Shirud Khalid bin Walid seized this, this golden opportunity to turn swiftly around to the rear of the Muslim army and surrounding them and killing Ibn Zubair and his group. And the policies, the Mushriks returned once again to counter-attack the Muslims. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in amongst a small group of fighters. But the genius of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised his voice calling out unto his companions, Ya Ibadallah, Ya Ibadallah. But it came at the cost of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being injured. The Quran beautifully describes the outcome of these events in the following verses. لَقَدَ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِهِ Allah verily made good His promise unto you when you routed them by His leave. حَتَّى إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Until the moment when your courage failed you and you disagreed about the order. وَعَصَيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَرَاكُمْ مَا تُحِبُّونَ And you disobeyed after He had shown you that for which you long. مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ Some of you desire the world and some of you desire the hereafter. ثُمَّ سَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ لِيَمْتَلِيَكُمْ وَلَفَدَ عَفَا أَنْكُمْ Therefore he made you run away from them that he might test you. Yet now he has forgiven you. Subhanallah, Allah is kafur. Allah is Lord of kindness to the believers. Remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside at anyone? While the messenger was calling you from behind. So Allah repaid you with distress upon distress. 
So you would not grieve for that which you had escaped of the victory and spoils of war. Wala ma asabakum, or for that which had befallen you of injury and death. In other words, Wallahu khabirun bima ta'malu, and Allah is fully acquainted with what you do. After the enemy had left, Nabi Ali Salam made his way around the battlefield to see the extent of the Muslim losses. Many of the most faithful Muslims had been killed. And some of the idolaters, men and women, they mutilated the Muslims that were killed. They cut off the ears, the nose, the genitals of the martyrs, Allah. They even cut open their bellies. Him ripped open the liver of Sayyidina Hamza and chewed it and spat it out. This was a hatred. She even made the ears and noses of Muslims into anklets and necklaces. Astaghfirullah. Nabi alayhi salam found the body of his beloved uncle, Hamza, who had been killed by Wahshi. At the site, Nabi alayhi salam said, there will never be a moment as sad for me as this. Subhanallah. Ya Allah. After the Prophet had prayed over the many dead, he said, I tell you that no one has been wounded in Allah's cause, but Allah will remember him and on the day of resurrection will raise him from the dead. They were buried where they had fallen as shaheed, as martyrs. Allah says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الْأَمْوَاتَ And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead. بَلْ أَحْيَامٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Rather they are alive. Was the Lord receiving provision? Subhanallah. Farihina bima atahum Allahu min fadli. Rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them of His bounty. Wa yastabshiruna bil ladina lam yalhaqu bihim min khalfihi. And they receive good tidings about those to be martyred after them who have not yet joined them. Allah khawfi alayhi wa lahu yanzanun. Then that there will be no fear concerning them. Nor will they grieve. يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِنِعْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ They receive good tidings of favor from Allah and bounty. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيُّ عَجَلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That Allah does not allow the reward for believers to be lost. SubhanAllah. I want to just go through a few. What are the lessons that we have learned? Victory is not guaranteed for Muslims. Winning the impossible war of Badr made some people think that they will be helped by Allah and that victory is a favor guaranteed by Allah but of course life doesn't work like that though it is Allah's right to grant it we have to set our own ways for victory we have to earn that victory likewise the glory of Islam in the future may be guaranteed but we have to work as such so that it can be realized in this world Amin Ya Allah it also teaches you how to forbear tragedies and losses. In the face of defeat, tragedy and losses, you must establish the reason between cause and effect. Do not be overly emotional, but rather learn from it to avoid future failure. And notice what you did right and wrong, so you can always use it in the future occasions. What to do when we suffer defeat? Point, this is point number three. Whenever we suffer defeat, we are to blame ourselves. Take account of ourselves and repent for our sins. Realize our own mistakes and promise yourself that you will act in a different, better way so that you can get different, better results next time. Defeat is a good time to let go of our ego because the results do not discriminate. When it comes to the obedience to the messenger, it's very important. Because of the disobedience, look what happened. Obedience to the Prophet is such a significant matter for this belief as exemplified in this part of Islamic history. Disobedience to the Prophet carry a negative consequence as the artists in Bahut have experienced themselves. Number five, disobedience and greed is a reason for defeat. Along with disobedience, greed is also an enemy of victory. Victory requires steadfastness, but disobedience and greed will distract you from being steadfast. If you want to succeed in fighting for this religion, 
fight your disobedience and your sense of greed. Allah give us that. And stay kind to people. Rasulullah his beautiful manner was spoken about in Surah Al-Imran. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ And by the mercy of Allah, you dealt with them gently. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْلًا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضْلُهُ مِنْ حَوْلِ And had you been severe and harsh-hearted, they would have broken away from about you. They would have run away, in other words. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمَرِ So pass over their faults and ask Allah's forgiveness for them and consult and consult them in their affair. فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then when you have taken a decision, put your trust in Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ Certainly Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. This leniency, leniency and softness motivate, motivate the people to fight harder and strive to obey Him more, which proves fruitful for the struggle. When people make mistakes, it doesn't mean you can be rude to them. Stay kind to people even after they did wrong. Hate the wrong. Like I always say, hate the wrong, not the person. Something, what do we do? Astaghfirullah, you did that, Jahannam to put you Who are you to ascribe Jahannam to whoever? There's been cases where Allah said, when, when somebody said, forgive him, Allah will never forgive him. So Allah forgave him and nullified his, all his good deeds. So be careful, be careful. Give people another chance. And do not let their mistake distract you from being unified. Number seven, and I end up with that. It teaches you to have hope. Defeat and victory is not permanent. The wheels will keep turning. If you keep them moving, after the battle of Ahud, they work hard for victory at the battle of Khandaq, the battle of Trench. <coughs> they get back even stronger and make your defeat a useful lesson. Take advantage of your mistake and it will be the foundation of your advantages in the future, inshallah. May Allah grant victory to our Palestinian brothers. Allah grant them ease, Ya Allah. Allah open up the hearts and minds of our Arab leaders and brothers that are there. It's not the people, it's the leadership that is failing our Palestinian brothers. Thank you very much for listening to my heart. Oh, yes. Um, you know, Haji Idrus Reka, who normally sits on that chair there, he's, he's not in hospital. We make dua, Allah grant him shifa, and ya arhamar rahimin. Allah make it easy. I believe we have some visitors here. Right? We have a couple of Syrians here. MashaAllah, ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaman bik. MashaAllah, bikum, MashaAllah. Enjoy Medina to Cape Town, MashaAllah.